لا تتفلسف I said لا تتفلسف Let me elaborate This is what someone would say to you if you were speaking incoherently with too many misunderstood or difficult terminologies Like in the event if you were trying to explain to someone about a certain metaphysical situation that they don't recognize or reveal to them some deep internal problem they might be experiencing لا تتفلسف It's Arabic But do any of these two words trigger any connection to an English word? Let's break it down. La means don't. Tetfelsef means... Okay, it's the verb form of the word felsefa. Still no clue? Fine. It means philosophy. So the translation for la tetfelsef would be don't philosophize. You see, these two words have negative connotations in the Arab world. They mean you're speaking mumbo-jumbo, meaningless words. And in the Arab Muslim world, That is exactly what philosophy is, to this very day, regarded as unnecessary and confusing idle talk. And the disrespect goes beyond this. Philosophy is extremely low on the list of credible sciences, maybe the lowest. I personally don't know anyone from my family, Arab friends or colleagues who have ever studied philosophy in an Arab university, or even in a Western one for that matter. And the cause was simple. At some point in Islamic history, Philosophy was presented in a dark light, as an antagonist to revelation and religion. Philosophy looked for meaning in creation and life that most Muslim jurists and scholars didn't want to contend with or even attempt to understand. The question of meaning was a no-no. Every question of why and their corresponding answers were already in the Qur'an. End of story. Consequently, philosophy was labeled as an evil practice, and with its historic mindset, The deeper philosophical interpretations of Revelation and its truths by Islamic scholars became so intolerable that in its own right, Revelation became both divine disclosure and reason, to the extent that what we know as reason became unreasonable or inapplicable. Did I just confuse you? What I'm saying is that in today's Arab Muslim world, philosophy is non-existent in terms of how we think or process life. The nature of questioning is not within Arabs. even though Islam as a faith demands the questioning of everything and has always lauded the intellect of man. Of the many revered Muslim polymaths during the Golden Age of Islam who were entrenched in philosophical discourse, one stands out when exploring revelation and reason, and that's Abu walid Muhammad ibn Rushd, known in the West as Avarus. Born in the city of Qurtuba in Al-Andalus in 1126, During the Almoravid Empire, Ibn Rushd not only excelled at the science of philosophy, but in others, including medicine, astronomy, and physics. He was also an Islamic jurist and judge, as well as an expert in the various schools of law. His achievements were numerous, but he is most known and respected for his strong advocacy of Aristotelian thought. His translations, reviews, and commentaries on Aristotle's works revived the entire civilized world's interest in the ancient philosopher. and led to the Western world naming him the Commentator. Another nickname bestowed upon Ibn Rushd by the West would be the father of rationalism, as a reflection to his powerful and influential exegesis. Ibn Rushd's work would go on to influence many thinkers from the late Middle Ages to the Renaissance, and from varying religions such as Maimonides and Thomas Aquinas. With over 100 books and treatises credited to him, Ibn Rushd's impact on the Muslim, Jewish, and Christian philosophies of the Middle Ages in specific, and both Renaissance and pre-modern civilization en masse, can be attributed to these following pieces of works. Fasl al-Maqal On the harmony of religions and philosophy can be described as a fatwa, a ruling, a treatise, or a work of academia, or all of them combined into one. The high-level ambitions of the Fasl were to first and foremost defend philosophy. as a true and valuable science that is not only worthy of being learned, but a necessary part of Islamic sciences. It attempts to establish a natural connection between religion and philosophy and presents the concept of double truths, an idea where two different paths, revelation and reason, can lead to the same truth. Fasl Maqal also defended the right of Muslim scholars to study and learn from non-Muslim authors of antiquity such as Plato and Aristotle. Bidayat al-Mujtahid The Distinguished Jurist Primer is a book of law where Ibn Rushd eloquently and comprehensively outlines the legal differences between the various Muslim denominations. 
He identifies the reasonings for such juristic principles from both an Islamic law jurisprudence and a philosophical perspective. The Bidaya further outlines how an independent jurist might understand, develop, and establish their own methodologies for deriving new theological law, while setting precedents for future judges to apply such rulings. Such an education of a jurist in the Bidaya is reinforced by the presentation of some of the greatest legal minds in Islam. Tahafut al Tahafut, or The Incoherence of the Incoherence, is a treatise written to counter al Ghazali's book Tahafut al Falasifa, The Incoherence of Philosophers. Al Ghazali had attacked the whole science of philosophy while attempting to destroy the treatises of Ibn Sina and his followers. In his book, Ibn Rushd himself discredits Ibn Sina's theories but exclusively as an individual's theories, and counters al-Ghazali by strongly defending philosophy as a whole and its relevance and importance to Islamic theological discourse. The Tahafut, written in a dialogue format between himself and al-Ghazali, again reiterates the idea that faith and philosophy are a harmonious duo. As the royal physician to the al muhad court, Ibn Rushd's aptitude for medicine was noted by his contemporaries and can be seen in his major enduring work Kitab al-Kulliyat fi tibb The General Principles of Medicine is a medical encyclopedia written between 1158 and 1162 current era that was a major reference book for Western medical training over the next six centuries. Don't forget to join the Chronicles by subscribing to the channel and like it if you do actually like it. And by clicking the notification button, you'll be up to date on all new releases. With such an exorbitant amount of treatises came controversy, and Ibn Rushd was no exception. His conclusions on the eternity of the world, on the question of whether the universe had always existed, or whether God had instantaneously created it out of nothingness, soon became a crossroads that you would have to negotiate. And with his intense readings in the Quran, Ibn Rushd's position reiterated the Aristotelian idea of God as the prime mover, the one who created the form of the universe as we know it, but nonetheless, a universe that had existed eternally. Ibn Rushd's controversies weren't solely focused on revelation, but also involved psychological thought about the human intellect. In his commentary on Aristotle's On the Soul, Ibn Rushd proposed the concept of a universal intellect, a source of universal knowledge and understanding that is outside the human mind, and that is accessible by all humanity, seemingly a parallel to the idea of collective wisdom. In the Middle Ages, women were a major cause of concern for Ibn Rushd. He believed that women were reduced greatly in servitude, crushing their will and aspiration for greater pursuits. He was a proponent for the equality of men and women and their God-given abilities, and for women's rights in serving society through higher causes such as governance, philosophy, and even religious jurisprudence. Controversies didn't play the most significant part of Ibn Rushd's sorry end. Not his mortal end, but the reputational devastation that destined him into the darkness of Muslim history. Due to Ibn Rushd's defense of philosophy, condemnation, exile, and the burning of his books ruined his standing in the Islamic world. Following his death, Ibn Rushd's fame skyrocketed, and his influence shone in a European world hungry for wisdoms of antiquity that he had so comprehensively assembled. But it would be the same West that would destroy his legacy, due to his teachings becoming incompatible with core teachings of Christianity. Thomas Aquinas, although initially inspired by Ibn Rushd, had to politically shift his position along with the changing stance of Christian jurisprudence and himself would attack many of Ibn Rushd's Aristotelian commentaries as either misrepresentations or totally incorrect. And with this criticism came the strategy of discrediting his influence and levels of ingenuity. As an example of this, one can look at his label, The Commentator and find in it an element of disrespect, belittling Ibn Rushd's works as strictly that of commentaries, of other thinkers, and ignoring many of his original works. Even in art, the disrespect shown by the West towards Ibn Rushd can be seen in Raphael's famous The School of Athens, where Ibn Rushd is included, but not as an honorable and wise philosopher, but one lacking a beard, whereas all the heavy-hitting philosophers and thinkers can be seen carrying long, and full beards, a sign of wisdom and intellect. And in the same setting, how Ibn Rushd is positioned as an observer, looking over the shoulder of Pythagoras, almost as if intending to cheat or copy from him. 
Iberrusht was lost to the Arab world up until the 19th century, when Arabs rediscovered his works and theories during the age of Al-Nahva. Enlightenment overwhelmed the Middle East and demanded new ways to contemplate the intellect and religious discourse, and Iberrusht's ideas seemed more aligned to the times. With time, many abolished Muslim philosophers of the Middle Ages that were put down or forgotten due to their writings or teachings have reappeared. Modernity seems to have caught up with the conventional ways of Islamic jurisprudence and law. The times demanded a new way to interpret the Word of God, far differently than how the Muslim scholars had done so over the past eight centuries. Yet this method has always been there in the treatises of the major Muslim philosophers, providing strong foundation for interpretation far ahead of their time. Obviously, today's Muslim clergy wouldn't like to shed light on this shift, to admit that those who were prohibited or banished, the philosophical thinkers like Ibn Rushd, were right all along. That reason and philosophy had a major role to play in our future. Not in isolation, but as a complement to faith, so that philosophy and the search for truth is reflective of real Islamic tradition. A tradition of asking the question, of thinking about the wise, in discovering what is true and what isn't, and maybe in shifting the old school mindset. When one wants to help another by explaining or figuring something out, la tetfelsef is not an option to be spoken anymore.